Um, hello, good afternoon. My name is Port McKevitt. I am uh, an architect. I'm living and working in Carlingford, County Louth, and uh, um, I want to tell you, take you on a journey uh, uh, of the restoration of Carlingford Station House. Um, boom. Right, just quick um, on Carlingford. Um, Carlingford, as you can see, is on the southern shores of Carlingford Lock which is a fjord, and as you can see, it's covered on, on both its um, southwestern and northeastern side by mountains. There are some fertile lands out to the sea. One is Cooley, the other is in, around Kilkeel uh, on, in Northern Ireland. But Carlingford was set up at that p uh, position to control goods coming into Carlingford Lock, and it landed all the goods, it paid its customs, and the goods were transferred then on tides up to Newry, and into the central Ulster heartland. So Carlingford was the second biggest uh, medieval port in Ireland, and its service was to Ulster. Um, as such, the town developed prior to the railway, um, somewhat <coughs> like this, where you have uh, the castle at the northern end of the town, the town uh, a planned, double street, walled, garrisoned town, with a castle and a quay, in the middle of the village where the commercial activity took place and this is a, a view um, of the village as it may have been uh, it's a little bit uh, the proportions are a little bit changed uh, prior to the railway so this is the deduced map of sort of 1835 before the railway you can see the the castle as it's marked in the center was the customs house it was decommissioned in the 1700s and then the railway um, was the big project in the 1800s. Um, the main railway, Dundalk, Belfast. Um, but Carlingford was becoming um, difficult to land larger ships. It was great for medieval port, but not good for modern port. But Green Ore, just beside it, was available. And the Great North, great North Western Railway Company in England developed a project whereby they would develop a port at Green Ore and a hotel and a rail line to Dundalk, mainly for, uh, well, tourism, but for cattle and goods to Hollyhead. Uh, that was 1873, but very quickly, uh, people in Northern Ireland were complaining to the government that one had to come all the way down to Dundalk to get out to Green Ore. So a second line was planned from Green Ore right to Newry, along the shores of the lock. £50,000 at the time, and that was 1873. It was uh, granted, and the works were completed by 1876. So the Carlingford line turned the village from that into that. So the railway came right by land grab, uh, grab lands from the sea and ran its way up through the, in front of the village and then from between the castle and the village at the top. But basically, that was the whole land grab of the railway. So this was a photograph we found in the National Library of Ireland before the, the railway happened. So you can see the castle, the customs house, as it was, the garrison. The piers had been built, but there's no railway. And that turned into something like this. So the railway came across the front of the village, right through, and went uh, through a sort of a tunnel in between the castle and the village. And if you can make out the building that's just appeared, the station house, that's the guy that we were working on. So here's another view from the south of the village. The, the railway line, a single railway line, was passed up through a platform. There was a d the, the, the station house was there, there was a siding, and all of this land was reclaimed from the sea and hid the medieval port behind it, and it became duly forgotten. So here we are. Um, this is the station house here, as it was. This is what my father calls the Stony Road. Um, but there was no access from the village uh, to the railway other than for the railway. Just a couple of things here. There's a double gable front in the building. This is a garden which belonged to the station master's house, which was this end of the building. On the far side of the building were toilets, stores, and in the middle was the ticket hall and access out onto the platform. So then the... At the time, the station house, this is the access road from the village. 
is the Lawrence photograph, so the, the, your access to the station house came past the old castle. This would have been the old harbour here. And then bus, buses used to use it as well, so they, it became a sort of a terminus. And this is the entrance side of the building on the other side. So in the early 1970s, um, the railway was replaced by this glorious road. And the building itself was sort of left a little bit lonely. Um, buses stopped there, but that's no trains anymore. The northern side of the building became a public toilet of not much comfort to use. And the, the, the building became a little bit redundant, although a tourist office did operate in through the main door here in recent times. So we went up to the Irish Rail Archive in Euston Street um, on the advice of um, one or two uh, local men who were heavily involved in railway uh, heritage. And we found uh, copies of a few things that they had there. One was a site plan showing the layout of it. Uh, broadly speaking, all the land that was taken, the sidings, the railway, the station house building, and the platform. The other thing we found was a <coughs> it's like a roll. And you roll it out, it's very, very long, but it's a section through the railway line before they planned it out. So here's the level of the railway, and the rest of it is the profile of the land that they were cutting or filling. And as you can see, here's the castle, and that's the pier that used to be there. So this, this is all filled in now. They intended to tunnel through that land beside the castle, but it must have collapsed because it's only a bridge now. And we found this, and this was gold dust. This is the plan of the building before it was built, and to get this was brilliant. Um, here's the left side of the building. Is You have a ladies' waiting room, which has a doorway onto the platform here. Doorway there. This is gents, ladies, station master's office and ticket, coals, lamps. The general waiting room. And then this here was the, the station master's residence, sitting room, bedroom, bedroom, and kitchen. It's a H-shaped plan. So from that, just getting into the restoration work, we did this sketch, which is a, an overlay of the survey drawing of the plan of the building as it was with the old plan. And what it showed up was a number of things. The, the, all the, gray, uh, the, gray, uh, the green walls are walls constructed in the 1960s. Um, the dotted line here is the front pa platform wall, which was removed. A new wall was built out in front here. This was, these were toilets, so these walls were put in. The ticket master's office and booth was blocked up. These were toilets, left and right, and an entrance into the middle. And then this was the, the, the station master's house. This, uh, there was a lot of damage caused here by this wall to make a toilet, especially just here at the window where the wall actually hit the frame of the window. Oh. They were good enough to leave the window box and window shutters, so they were saved. So then we started some investigative works to find out where all these bits and pieces were. So that we found the Ticketmaster's ticket office and booth over here. Um, we also found this door that went from the platform into the ladies' waiters' room. We start to find it here, but we, what we found it was like this 12-foot tall sandstone surround doorway, which was nice to find. And then on the other side here, there had been no access from this ticket hall into the station master's residence, but it was open out in the 60s, and a fireplace was, uh, was um, um, made redundant or gotten rid of, but there was a lot of cracking, and uh, these uh, beams weren't great, so they needed to be strengthened. So up in the roof, there was a king post truss, very nice. Uh, these were the toilets. Um, we stripped off the plaster. We found some cabinetry in the st station master's office, uh, which were original but in very bad nick. And we also found a trunk of carpenter's tools, um, which were all dating from, well, the last we know is 1947, because there was a log book in it and he had all his dockets and stuff from that year. So we were able to keep that and represent. An interesting part about the building was this chevron thing that happened here. This corridor came in and it 
sort of closed off to a point and there was a door left and a door right and it made things a bit difficult obviously because getting from using the building was difficult with that detail so the external walls we found were um, battened out and lathed so that there was a, a cavity so it was uh, an early form of building that was trying to insulate itself we had uh, a lot of damage caused in the toilet section. Uh, this is concrete there, that's sandstone, that's sandstone. So yeah. we had damage around here. The, the eaves, um, the rainwater goods were a very special feature of the building and they were in a, a fairly bad way, although a lot of the timber was fine. It needed to be checked, bits taken off to put back, um, tidied up, and there was these lead parapets which needed to be, the lead needed to be replaced, restructured underneath and redressed. And finding, of course, the original details to do that was only one of them that was left, one little eaves detail, but we managed to get it um, back. The chimneys um, were also very special. We were missing, missing two and a half of them. Um, the rest of them looked okay. One of them was a bit cracked, but it was solid enough. Um, the pointing was, um, had fall had, had, uh, uh, withered away in spots or was deteriorating in spots sorry and just this photograph here is more about the landscape it's in because since the railway left the access to the village comes from that area now and of course the provision of car parking and seas of tarmac become very uh, prevalent so it was an interesting project in in a sort of a, a landscape um, which was difficult to feel comfortable in Okay, so the plan we drew up was to do an exhibition area in the middle. Uh, because we found a lot of stuff in the station master's house that was still original and that was still restorable, we decided to uh, annex that to the exhibition. It also had the advantage of using the, the lamp store as a switch room and gave us access into that. There was a retail area or a tourist shop which was already extant in the building, so they got reaccommodated in here. And we were going to try and look at that north elevation which actually faced the castle and had some great views as a new shop front so turning the public toilets into a tourist office so uh, yeah uh, excuse me what, what are you proposing so and anyway um, and this side we had a couple of offices we had a meeting room for a local heritage group and a kitchenette, kitchenette that addresses it and a universal access loo so all the brown walls are the new bits and the rest is pretty much as it was Again, this is just the, the, the front of the building. Um, if I, let me see. This glass element here at the front, the original wall was here, but it was gone. The front wall was concrete block and plastered, so we took it away, replaced it with the glass wall, and restructured the whole roof back onto this wall here by putting a beam across. So that allowed us to keep the glass element of it to the front of the building as light as possible so we could just give the view that you would have had platform. So the, just the, the, the existing toilet or public toilets was this one here. You can see the damage above and to the side of the door. And what we proposed to do was turn it into this guy here. This was the original here. So there was a door, a door, a door, and a window either side of a door. And the side window is still there, the door is still there and we made some adjustments just in between to give it a shop front but you can still read the old, uh, the legibility of the building is still, still there. So this is the, the entrance to the side of the building, there's very little work goes on there except you know, the chimneys. Um, these are the chimneys, they're captains, captains is what their, names, what their name is or how they're described, they were produced by the uh, by uh, um, uh, Garen Kirk in just outside Glasgow, um, which was uh, a very, very, very big uh, producer of all sorts of uh, ceramic stuff back in the late middle to uh, end of the 1800s. Um, interestingly, they, they, they say they were exporting all over the world. Um, I like this bit at the end here where they uh, was the largest fire clay firm in the world covering six acres employing 300 men and boys and manufacturing 200 tons of fire clay different times 
These were the eaves, the gutters, which were very special. They're, they can't, they're not normally, normally a, a gutter has, normally as gutter has a flat back. These went <coughs> right up underneath the slates and uh, allowed the, the eaves from the underside to have exposed rafter ends. So this was the day we took out the stone wall and we saw the view across the lock, which was a good day. And this is the ticket hall. And this is, this is uh, on the opposite side of that sandstone doorway, we found the, the stonework that would have been exposed in the platform externally on the original building. So we boxed out the wall where it would have been to give that legibility. And this is the shop front under construction. And this is more or less as it's finished. So this is the view, as you would have seen, from the ladies' waiting room to the platform. There's the, the sandstone doorway. Uh, we used a glass, frameless glass doors and that to allow the masonry speak. And similarly, we got a very, very fine detail around here um, to just keep the framing down and keep the view maximized. And then we put limestone paviors where the old wall used to, been, used to have been and, and clad the, the ceiling with, uh, with timber to make that legible again. <coughs> So that's the ticket hall again. This, this is the bench that we found in the station master's office. We managed to cobble together bits and pieces of it that were still okay and put it back. And these are the tools of the carpenters in the trunk we found. This is the view down to the, to the station master. The chevron is still there. We, it's still there above, so we structured that so that you can still read it. And that allows a wheelchair to go down. There's a widening to the hall and there's a loo down there. And this is the view back up. This here is just a little bit of a, a rainwater um, pipe. Um, and just the color of the paint um, struck me um, um, as being very special. And it was underneath the white that it had been painted. So we used it. So that's how it finished off. Um, the glass in the middle, all the chimneys are gone, and the roof is repaired. That took a lot of work to do that. Um, Right, because the builder at every turn was, oh, would you not use the ordinary gutters? Would you not use this? Anyway. So eventually we got them over the line. And the local community then went and got four seats made. And each, each of the seats bears the name of one of the local stations, as was. So that's the view from the car park. And that's the shop front there, the new tourist office. And over the main door of the tourist office, we just inscribed the word Carlingford. So the only signage on the building is that particular word. And um, in front of it again, so that's how it looks. The, front. The, the railing to the front again is, there's parts along the railway that still have railings like that. So we got some made and it gave a defensive space to the, from vehicles to uh, pedestrians. And just as a last slide, um, the, uh, Couple of, couple of the things about it. One is that this area here, directly in front of the building that's paved, um, <coughs> was the car park. And cars were parking up on that up until two weeks ago, until the council painted the car parking spaces. And now we can sort of safely say, I think it's the first bit of pedestrian land that we've got in Carlingford that hasn't been lost to cars. Oh, no, so it's, it's a real sort of... Uh, and uh, and uh, the, 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 the building lights at night, you know, and it's got four outside lights, we just lit up the gables. And, um, you know, Carlingford is like 20 minutes from Newry, 25 minutes from Dundalk, it's a bit of a drive, and you arrive, and seeing this little building just lit up um, as your own station house and to know that you're home is one of the real great feelings about this building coming back into the mix in Carlingford. So... And hopefully the other projects following on from this would involve stuff we could do maybe around the medieval port, but we have a whole area in front of Carlingford which has potential now, and this is the sort of flag in the ground, and hopefully we can move on from there. Thanks very much.